Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jill Carroll. Thank you all for coming today and thank you for having me here. I never take it for granted, you know, that people come out to hear anything I have to say, especially on a Saturday when the water's green. <laughs> Uh, so thank you. There are many of you who, you know, you could be doing other things with your families, with your friends. It's a weekend, and for many of you, this is a day off, and you've chosen to be here and, and, uh, and listen to me and to see this presentation and, and to be with our friends here at Niagara. So thank you for that. I, I appreciate that, and I'm honored by it. And I want to thank the Niagara Foundation for inviting me to come up here to Chicago. When I left uh, Houston this morning very, very early, it was um, 86 degrees, and... Uh, and I know that I'm in a different country now when I get off the plane here. But I've always enjoyed Chicago. And I was telling someone earlier that I, uh, living in Houston, Texas, I, I, you, know, you, you go to different cities. And whenever I come to Chicago, I feel that I'm at home uh, because there's something very um, neighborly and friendly about Chicago. And so I see it in your faces as you're here today. I guess what I would like to begin by, by doing is telling you a little bit about who I am. And it's not because I'm important or I'm someone special. It's because when I, I feel this way, that when you read a book that someone has written, it's important to know who that person is. Like, what are their commitments? And what's their background? And what, what perspective are they bringing to that, to that book? And what's the context in which they write that? Because you need to know that. I think as a reader, as when I read books, I want to know that about the author so that I can understand more clearly. So I want to I share that with you so that you know who it is that's standing in front of you a little bit, and you know who it is that's written this little book that some of you may choose to read. Uh, the book really is, it comes at an intersection of three different elements, I would say, of my life. Some of them are professional, and some of them are very personal, although I have to say that the boundary for me between the professional and the personal is pretty much not there, really. It's, it's blurred because I'm one of the very fortunate individuals who gets to work and make my living as a, in my career doing something that's very aligned with who I am as a person and what my values are and what my, my understanding of life is. And that's, that's a gift, and, and I, I feel very blessed to live that way. But there are three sort of um, components, I guess, that come together in an intersection and in it's in that intersection that, that, that you really find the context for what the ideas that I've shared in this book and the ideas that frankly I'm obsessed with uh, that's what that's, that's as good a reason as any to write a book you're just obsessed you know and you need to write and you need to explain uh, what you're thinking the first component is uh, my work at the Bonyak Center, and Osgore mentioned in the introduction that I am the executive director of the Bonyak Center for Religious Tolerance at Rice University. We are a new, relatively new center, just over three years of existence, and our mission is to understand and to facilitate the conditions that lead to peaceful coexistence among people of different religions. Peaceful coexistence among people of different religions. That's who we are. That's what we do every day. All of our projects and initiatives, whether they're research projects, whether they're teacher training, uh, student initiatives, community outreach programs, all of the stuff that we do is aligned around that one goal, to understand and to try to facilitate the conditions that lead to peaceful coexistence. I believe that finding a way to live together amidst radical difference is the central challenge of our era. Every era has its challenges. Some, some are uh, natural in nature, natural disasters or illnesses. Others are social in nature and are brought about by our communal lives together. This era, I believe, the challenge is peaceful coexistence. How will we live together as ourselves with others who are different from us? And so at the center, that is our mission. And that's what we try to learn about and expose ourselves to. And so that mission very much drives 
what I do and, and how I think about things and the lens through which I encounter the world. I, I walk around in life and in the world looking, it's almost like I have a pair of glasses that, that that's what that mission is. Peaceful coexistence. How are we achieving it? How can we achieve it? And I see things through that lens and so I'm on the lookout for that all of the time. And so that's very much a part of who I am as I stand here in front of you and as I write this book. And in case you're wondering, um, Bonyak, the name of our center, people always say, is that some you know, obscure languages word for peace or something, you know, like Klingon for peace or something? No, it's not. It's the name of the person who gave the money. Uh, that's some of you, you live, work in universities, you know that that's how it works. When you give lots of money, you get to have your name on it. So Dr. Milton Bonyak and his wife Lori gave the founding endowment, and so that's their name, uh, in case you were just wondering. It's an, it's an interesting name, but people are always confused by it. The second component is the, that really forms a background for me on this is the 15, 18 or so years of teaching that I've done at the university level. Like so many of you here who, are, who have academic backgrounds and you have areas of specialty, you have advanced degrees in your areas of specialty, you know, we've all got our niche. And the more you go, the more letters you get after your name, at least over here in this part of the world, the more specialized you become. So that by the time you get the PhD in whatever it is, you know, you're a PhD in this tiny little area and about eight other people can read your book, you know, or your work because it's become so narrow and so specialized. And that's true for me as well. I have, you know, my PhD has me specialized in something very, uh, very narrow. My background is in religious studies and philosophy of religion, in particular in continental philosophy of religion and in particular in in 19th and 20th century continental philosophy of religion, in particular, the French phenomenologist Emmanuel Levinas, you know, I could just go on forever and ever, okay? And so the thing that happens, though, is when you, at least in the humanities and social sciences, when you get out and you begin to teach, which I began to teach actually before I finished my doctorate, you're mostly thrown into teaching classes that have nothing to do with your specialty. And I was thrown into that same kind of situation and immediately was thrown into teaching what we in the university affectionately call the Plato to NATO courses. <laughs> where you read um, the great books, the great, you know, world intellectual history, world philosophy, world religions, world literature from the ancient period, starting with something like the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Iliad and the Odyssey from Homer, some of the most ancient stuff that's ever been done in the, hu in the human race. And then if you're lucky, you have two semesters in which to s just run roughshod over all of it until you end with World War II and you read something like um, doc, if you're here, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail, or you may read a Holocaust memoir or, or something. And so you've covered this huge span of world philosophy, intell you know, intellectual history, covering all sorts of genres all over the continents, everywhere in two semesters. Now, nobody has a PhD in this. Nobody has a specialty in this. You have to develop competencies in areas outside your specialty in order to even teach these classes. And I taught these classes and still when I do teach now, I, I don't have a teaching responsibility now, but when I do, I still teach these types of classes now for about 18 years. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because I have found that this has been one of the most blessed gifts of my life as a scholar and as a person because it has taught me to be able to see connections across vast spaces of time and geography and culture and worldview. When I'm teaching, you know, 6th century BCE Chinese philosophy and I'm, I'm going over with my students Confucianism and Taoism and the period of, uh, of the philosophers there, I immediately can see connections between what Confucius argues and what Plato is arguing, Socrates and Plato at almost the same time, roughly contemporaries of each other in ancient Greece in a very different culture, in a very different language across a, a, a chasm really.
And so I think this is a very, actually it's a very specialized way of looking at things. I guess if I could say it now, I guess I would say I've become a specialist at being a generalist. <laughs> um, because this is a certain way of thinking. It's a way of seeing the forest and not only the trees. I mean, there is something of value to be able to see the trees and to be able to see the actual branches on the trees and the leaves on the branches and the little grooves on the leaves and the little, you know, to see the minute detail. There's tremendous value in that. But then there's also tremendous value in being able to back out and see the entire forest and see what's over that next horizon and see the larger picture. Because then you, you have a larger context, your frame becomes bigger, and you begin to see that we're not lost in the details. And so this is of interest to me. Because when I bring myself back to the question of how will we live together as ourselves in the midst of radical difference, I'm inclined to say that even if we're very different, even if we're coming from vastly different perspectives, vastly different cultures and languages and religions and worldviews, that if we look hard enough and if we are committed to find it, we can find a point of connection. It, it is there to be found. We have to be willing to find it, though. And I've done it in academic work and in teaching, and so the point is not just to do it in that realm, but to do it in a larger realm. So that's very much in the background of, of, of the task that I set myself for in this book, and in really in life, is to be on the lookout for those points of connection where they can be had. A third component is much more personal, although, as I said, all of this stuff is very personal to me. But a third component is very personal, and it has to do with my own encounter with the community of people inspired by the ideas of Fethullah Gulen. I first traveled to Turkey as a guest of the Gulen community, the particular branch of, a, of the Gulen community that's based in Houston. I first traveled in December of 2004 and have since uh, been back. I've been to Turkey five times in the last three years, two other times as a guest of the Gulen community and then other times as not. And, you know, it's an interesting thing because I'm sitting in my office uh, on Rice University campus and I hear this knock at my door and I open the door and these uh, young Turkish men are standing there and they're Rice students and they say, can we come in and see you, Dr. Carroll? And I said, absolutely. So they, they come in and, and they say, hello, my name is Jamal, my name is Asman, and I'm here to see you. And I said, hi, nice to see you. How can I help you? And they say, uh, well, we're PhD students in bio, nano, something or other. I don't know what they were doing. Uh, that's the other side of the campus for me. But uh, everything at Rice is nano something, so uh, mostly. So they are PhD students in that. And, um, and they told me a little bit about themselves. And I said, that sounds very wonderful. How can I help you? And, and they said, well, we're very concerned with interfaith dialogue. And I said, uh, very good. So am I. How can I help you? <laughs> and finally, they just blurted it out. They said, would you like to come to Turkey? <laughs> Just like that. And I looked at them and I said, who are you? <laughs> and they began the story all over again. Well, my name is Asman and my name is Jamal. And they just kept doing the same thing. And so I, you know, I visited with them and, and I met with others of the representatives of the equivalent, not the equivalent because nothing can be as great as Niagara, but the, the one in Houston, which is called IID, Institute for Interfaith Dialogue. And I met with them, and uh, they had invited some of my other colleagues at the university to go to Turkey. And on that one trip, I was the only one who ended up going. And I tell you, it was the first time they had done a Turkey trip, and so the organization was a little bit loose. Thing, it was, they were new doing it, so a lot of the details kind of got dropped. And to the point where I, I didn't know who I was visiting in Turkey. I didn't know where I was staying. I didn't have my tickets till two days before. I had no contact phone numbers. I had nothing. I didn't even know who I was traveling with. Nothing. And my parents and my colleagues were like, You're, what are you doing? Uh, well, I'm going to Turkey with these people. And, and, um, and they said, who are these people? I said, well, they're really nice. <laughs> And they, you know, and I got on the surface of it how weird it seemed and how risky it seemed. Um, for, you know, but I, I had a sense in my spirit that this was something to say yes to. And so I said yes to it. 
And there's something about this. You know, I've reflected on this so deeply over the last few years. There's sometimes we have to say yes to things when we don't have all the answers. You know, we say yes to being parents when we have no clue how to raise kids. We say yes to being married when we have no clue how to be a spouse. You know, I mean, life demands that of us sometimes. And it, it takes something for us to do that, to say yes to an invitation when it's risky. And there are, it may not work out well, but it might. And this is the challenge. I mean, this is related to the challenge that we have before us in our era. There's an invitation in the air for us to reach across boundaries and say yes to something that maybe we've not done before, to say yes to a way of being that we've not been before. And it's risky. And it may not always work out well. But the invitation is there. And I think it's important for us to say yes to it. And I am so grateful to God or whoever gave the grace for me to be able to say yes to that invitation. So I went to Turkey and I visited. Uh, you saw just short clips there on that video of, of the, of the ed educational institutions, the schools, the preparatory, the exam preparation institutions, and all the dozens and dozens and of kinds of civil society projects that the uh, people of the, what I'll just loosely call the Gulen community, what they give themselves to. And I saw this in Turkey. We traveled all around the country in five or six or seven major cities of the country. And I visited a few dozen of these schools and hospitals and other kinds of projects. And I have to tell you that I was deeply confronted by my own cynicism. And I didn't realize that I'd become cynical until I went there and was on that trip because you know, I'm a pretty optimistic person. I tend to see the glass as half full. I'm not a negative sort of sour person. But on some level, I think at some point, and I can't really say when it happened, it's just a gradual process, I somehow had become cynical where I doubted that good people with good intentions could give themselves to good projects, devote themselves wholly, and good things could happen as a result. Somehow I just stopped believing that, or stopped believing that it could just happen as a matter of course, or that when I saw it in the world, as I did when I visited Turkey and in all my subsequent interactions with the Gulen community around this country and in, other, in Europe and other places, when I see it repeatedly again and again, initially I was suspicious. There must be a catch. People can't be this good. People can't be this committed. It can't be this simple. And I would ask the people the same questions. How did you, tell me your story of how you learned of Mr. Gulen's ideas. And what about the ideas grabbed you? And why do you give of yourself in the way that you do, either through your financial resources or through your, your time and your energies and your other resources? Why do you give of yourself? And the answer was the same all across Turkey, all across the United States, the places in Europe, every place I've been the last three and a half years where I've intersected with the Gulen community. The answers are always the same. We believe that this is important. We believe that these are human values that we all must advance in the world. And we believe that we have to give ourselves to this as much as we can. And it's just that simple. And at first I was asking, OK, where's the Kool-Aid? I know you're drinking. You know, I, I'm a religious studies person. I study cults. You know, I'm thinking, what is the, what, this can't be right. But it, it is. It's very simple. It's a vast transnational civil society movement inspired by the ideas of one imam, Turkish, Sunni, coming from the largest interpretive school in Sunni Islam, the Hanafi school. It, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, three generations now of people inspired by these ideas, inspired to do good things, to, to contribute in a good way to society. And so I'm forever changed because not only of that first trip, but because of my sustained, uh, that continues to this very moment, uh, interaction with the Gulen community.
and the people inspired by these ideas because it shook me out of a fog. I think I was headed toward a deep fog of cynicism and I'll be forever grateful for being snapped out of that. So, so these are the things, my, my experience in my teaching, my commitment to peaceful coexistence and my own personal experience, these things come together and they form the background for why I write what I write, why I do what I do and, and who I am here with you. And you know, we each of us, we have our own distinct backgrounds and my story is different than yours. But I feel that we are aligned here in this room on many of these points, even though, even though we've come to this point through different paths, through as many as are sitting here in the seats. And so I acknowledge that in you because even though I've never met most of you until today, I feel that there is a, com a common commitment that we share to creating a culture of tolerance and respect and compassion and peaceful coexistence among people of different religions and among just people in general. You know, they're ideal in world religions. That's my area of specialty and my area, my discipline. And so I mostly deal with religious worldviews. But I think that what I'm about to, to say and suggest to you is true for, for just worldviews in general. But I, I'll limit it to religious worldviews because that's what I deal with mostly. There are two very common ideas that show up a lot in interfaith dialogue circles. And I know many of you spend a lot of time in those kinds of activities as I do. But there are two very common ideas that show up that I think are both problematic. And I want to just say a couple of words about that. One common belief that comes up in interfaith dialogue is this. All the world's religions and the, the, the religious world views, and that's exactly what they are. They're not just um, a list of beliefs. They're full-blown world views. I mean, when you're a religious person, and that's something more than just a word in your life, you encounter the world through the framework of that religion. I mean, that's a, that's a world view for you. Common belief says all the world's religions are really all the same. They're all basically the same. You know, they have different names for God, and they have different rituals, and they have different histories, and yeah, there's some differences, but those differences are largely cosmetic. They're just on the surface. And people stay up at this surface level of the cosmetic differences, and they end up clashing with one another. But if they would just ignore those differences and go deeper, they would see that they're all the same. They would see that we really all basically worship the same God. And if we could just forget those differences and push to that basic sameness that's there, then we could do away with conflict rooted in religion. So that's one belief, very commonly expressed in interfaith dialogue. The other one is at the opposite end of the spectrum. It says, the religious worldviews, especially the oldest and biggest, one, biggest ones, they are so completely different from each other, so fundamentally different that they will never, ever really understand each other. They may, it may look like they're connecting, it may look like they're really trying to speak the same language, but really they're just talking past each other because they are so profoundly different that inevitably there will be conflict and disagreement and perhaps outright clash a clash of worldviews, what most commonly is called a clash of civilizations, a, a clash of civilizational identities. And of course, Samuel Huntington is the most famous um, uh, purveyor of this type of argument. So these are very commonly expressed ideas, and I find both of them problematic. The idea that all the religions are basically the same, as someone who specializes in world religions, I cannot agree with that statement. They're not all the same. In fact, they're, they're, many, they're very, very different. We cannot say that they all worship the same God. Not all the world's religions worship a God at all. <laughs> Taoism, Confucianism, the two indigenous religions of China, they don't worship a God. It's not about worshiping a God. There's no God. There's no one God or even a God at all, really, in those religious philosophies. In Buddhism, the third largest religion in the world, the three largest religions, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, there is no God, really, in Buddhism. In its philosophical heart, the way Buddha himself taught it, it is an atheistic philosophy. Atheistic, a theos, no God. 
Now, some Buddhists in popular practice will treat the Buddha as if he is a god, but Buddha himself said, I am not a god. I am a man who's achieved enlightenment, and you can do the same thing exactly like I have done it. There's nothing special about me. I've just achieved further progress on the path. So even the third largest religion in the world, we can't say, is worshiping the same god. It doesn't worship a god at all. Even the ones that do worship gods, can we say that it's the same God and are, are the practitioners of those faiths comfortable saying that? Are, we, are they comfortable, for example, if we take a contemporary Hindus today, Hinduism, uh, Hinduism in the modern period for the last several hundred years has been a monotheism, one God, many faces. One God, but that God has many different dimensions and aspects and facets, and they all go by different names, which are sometimes personified into the different gods that you see in Hinduism. But it's really all just different facets of the one primal divine reality that's often, you know, maybe called Krishna or maybe called Vishnu, whichever name you choose to, to call that one God. Is Krishna the same as Allah? We all worship the same God. Supposedly, are we comfortable saying that? Some people are, some people are not. Can we say it's the same God? Can we say, I mean, in the Abrahamic traditions, yes, we have the same God. But is, is Krishna the, the Christ spirit? Or yeah, You see what I'm saying? It's hard to make the transition if we're insisting we're really all worshiping the same God. What if we're not? What if we're not all worshiping the same God? What if we just don't have the same conception of God at all? What are we going to do then? So I'm concerned about this because I don't think it's really fruitful as we proceed and try to find a way to live together, to insist upon some sort of primary sameness. We have to develop a capacity in ourselves to relate with people who are very different from us, who pray to different gods than us, who will never believe in the same God that we believe in. They may never believe in a God at all. At all. And so insisting on the sameness, I don't think is a fruitful path. Now the other view which says they're so completely different they can never talk and inevitably will end up in conflict and clash, I think that goes too far. Yes, they're profoundly different sometimes. Yes, completely different worldviews. But the inevitability of clash, the inevitability, the necessity of conflict, no. I myself cannot say that. Mainly because, and I, I think Mr. Gulen would agree with me on this. If I'm blessed enough to get to meet him again, I'll have to ask him. But I, I'm not a determinist. Whatever will happen, in the future with regard to clash or conflict of civilizations will happen because you and I have chosen it. If we have a clash of civilizations, it will be because we chose that or we failed to choose otherwise. We choose, the world is what it is, why? Because we've chosen to make it the way that it is. This is the, I spend time with this in the fifth chapter of the book where I put Mr. Goulin and John Paul Sartre the French atheist existentialist, into a sort of textual dialogue together on this issue of responsibility, where they both, from their own perspectives, are arguing that you and I are 100% responsible for the world. From an Islamic perspective of Mr. Gulen, yes, Allah has created the world, Allah governs the world with a great providential power, has infinite knowledge of everything that's happened in the past and what's going to happen in the future, and we are Allah's deputies, vicegerents. That's the English translation of the Turkish word that he uses there. We are the actors. We are the agents through which Allah's plans get actualized in the world. It doesn't happen without us. It doesn't happen without us choosing and deciding what is right to choose and deliberating with each other and committing ourselves in our deepest hearts to go forward and achieve whatever there is to achieve. We are 100% responsible for the world. So if there's a clash that comes, it won't, have, it won't have come because it's inevitable or fate has declared it or there's just no other way to avoid it. It will be because we did not choose otherwise.
And so the opportunity that's there for us is to choose otherwise, is to choose to say, yes, there are differences, and we can acknowledge those, and we can be with each other in the midst of those, and we can make deliberate, intentional choice to find connection so that when the differences are very present for us, we have those handle holes with each other. We have those bonds of relationship with each other on the points that we can connect on that can sustain us where the di when, in times when the differences seem very profound. So this little book, and it is little by the way, you know, uh, mostly people in that, you know, birds fly, dogs bark, scholars write books. And mostly they're dreadful, <laughs> uh, especially in my business, because they're horrible academies and you can't read them. I, this was a little short book. I didn't write it for a specialist in my field. I wrote it for a more general audience. And so, you know, if you choose to read it, it's a little modest co contribution. But it's an attempt to find a middle path between these two extreme views that say they're all the same or they're all different. The, the metaphor, the central metaphor that I use, and that's not a metaphor, it's, a, it's a, an action word, is resonance. Resonance. I try to find resonance between the ideas of Mr. Goulin and the others that I put him into dialogue with. Confucius, Plato, John Stuart Mill, Immanuel Kant, and John Paul Sartre on particular issues. I put Mr. Goulin in a conversation with Kant on the issue of moral value, inherent human moral dignity, that human beings have inherent value, not market value like chairs and tables and screens and computers, but inherent value, that as human beings we have inherent worth, and that's the seed of our morality, and that our morality is generated from acknowledging that profound inherent value of all human beings. You saw in the little promotional video several quotes from Mr. Goulin about humanity, that love for humanity, and that human values are the grounding and starting point. I find him very resonant with Immanuel Kant on this. Now, Immanuel Kant is, personally, he's a Christian, but he doesn't do his philosophy as a Christian philosopher. He does it in a purely secular rationalist way. And so the challenge there was to find a point of resonance between a, an Islamic philosopher and theologian on the one hand, 20th century, now 21st century, and a Enlightenment era continental philosopher on the other who's writing from a secular rationalist perspective. I put Mr. Goulin and John Stuart Mill in a conversation on the issue of freedom, particularly the issue of freedom of thought and freedom of conscience, that somehow, and they both argue this, we're not really fully human unless we are allowed to be free in our thinking and in our inquiry and in our reflection and our deliberations about things, that our humanity becomes fully actualized through that. I put Glenn and Plato and Confucius in a trialogue together on issues of the ideal human being. What is the ideal human being? What's our, what's our model? What's our profile of the ideal human being that we would like to be or that we would like to create in the world? What is that? And then how do we get that person? Do, they just, do people like that just come down from the heavens fully formed and ready made? No, how do we get them? We give birth to them and we raise them, which means we have to educate them. So I have two chapters, the ideal human being and education. And I, as you maybe saw from the video, if the Gulen community is known for anything in the world, it's the educational activities and the commitment to education and the cultivation of the human spirit through education. And then finally, in that fifth chapter, I already mentioned it to you, I put Gulen and Sartre into a conversation about responsibility. This is a challenging chapter. Not just because Sartre's difficult to read, um, they all are, but uh, Sartre's an atheist. Gulen is an Islamic scholar, an imam, a preacher, and Sartre's an atheist. And both of them are on record blasting the beliefs of each other. Not by name, Sartre didn't know Gulen. Um, Gulen doesn't blast Sartre personally, but he, he, he doesn't do that in general, but he blasts the philosophy uh, expounded by Sartre. Existentialism, atheism, has very harsh words for that, for that as a philosophy, as a worldview. And Sartre is very hard on religious belief. 
So how do you find, how, what do you do there? How do you put those, how, how can you find any point of connection there when these two representatives of these perspectives even have sharp words on record for each other? It's there. You have to look, but you can find it. It's there. There's resonance on this issue of responsibility. When I use the word resonance, you know, it's a musical term. Some of you are musicians. So if you're playing a keyboard and you hit a three chord note, you've got three distinct notes. And they're, they're not the same. They're distinct. But if you play them together in a certain way, they can resonate beautifully together. And sometimes you can play them in a way where they, there's dissonance. But even that dissonance can be contained in a larger work that can be beautiful, that can be pleasing, that is workable as a work of, of music, as a, as a composition. So I like the term resonance. I don't say Gulen and Kant are the same. They're not. They're absolutely not the same. They're, they're generations removed from each other. They're coming from completely different cultures. You take someone like Gulen and Plato, Gulen and Confucius, they're so not the same. We cannot say they're the same. They're maybe not even similar, but there's resonance. We can find resonance right there. So I like that term resonance because it acknowledges the fact that there's profound difference, but it's still willing to find a connection. Huntington's work, of course, is in the background. He's become the whipping boy, I think, in many ways, for those of us who care about interfaith dialogue. And I do think that he takes his argument too far. And some of you I know are familiar with his work about clash of civilizations. Others, you, others of you may not be that familiar with it. I think he goes too far in some instances in talking about the inevitability of clash, that, that there's just really no way around it. But I also think that some people who have criticized him harshly for his views have also failed to see some very insightful things that Huntington argues about civilizational identity. And I think there are a couple of valuable little gems in his work that um, this little book, I, I think, tries to live in a little bit. And I, and I want to just very briefly point to those. One thing that Huntington does is that he points out that the, a, a, a mentality that he calls a, a West versus the rest. The West versus the rest mentality and how so many of our security and um, uh, international economic systems and all kinds of things are dominated by the West and the West is being aggressive sometimes and pushing that on other cultures and other countries and they're rightfully rejecting it and uh, pushing it back and sometimes doing so via insisting on their own civilizational identity as opposed to the Western identity. And that that's a conflict in the making and it's a clash in the making that could be very deadly. And I think that it's definitely true. I mean, it's not hard to see how the West has become uh, aggressive in many ways. It's become culturally imperialistic in many ways. These are just obvious sort of social political lessons that anyone reading history can see. Where I think he goes wrong in, say, in saying that things like the uh, rule of law, uh, respect for human dignity, um, free markets, uh, fair economic systems, uh, notions of liberty and equality, notions of human dignity, that these are exclusively Western concepts. He says they're Western concepts, and it's almost like the, the West has a monopoly on them. I think that's not true at all, and I think it's dangerous for us to begin to say that because it, it shows its own kind of myopia, you know, that the West has a monopoly on these values. I think that even in my little book, you can begin to see, and if you, if you study world history, you can see that these types of ideas show up across the civilizations, across centuries of civilizations, that the West has a particular take on these issues, but that these issues have have been working themselves out and burbling beneath the surface for generations and in many different cultures. And to say that the West has a monopoly on them is, is wrong. Historically, it's wrong. And it's dangerous, and it's arrogant, and it's aggressive. So I think we have to begin to move away from that kind of Western myopia and begin to see the tremendous contributions that the other kinds of cultures that long predate the West, the modern West, that these offer us tremendous tremendous values, humanistic values, humanistic not in a secular kind of way, but human-based values that we can glean from all sorts of different traditions and bring them together and begin to have a conversation across these divisions. A second thing, very briefly, he talks about the us versus them 
mentality that can develop when we exclusively identify ourselves in religious or ethnic terms. And some of you know exactly what I mean by this, not because you've done it, but because you've seen it. And we all can see it in the newspaper every day, where people, groups of people, because of some sort of threat, perceived or real, feel the need to identify themselves in singular monolithic ways. I am Jewish. I am Muslim. We are Western. We are this. We are that. And mostly it's religious or ethnic terms. We are Kurdish. We are Turkish. We are American. We are whatever it is. Fill in the blank. And we forget all the other things that we are. We're just that one thing. And if you don't look like that one thing we are, you are them. There's us. And those who look like us and act like us and believe like us, and then there's them. And it ignores the complexity of human life. It ignores the complexity of the human experience. No one of us is any one thing. No one of us is only our religious identity, only our racial identity, our gender identity, our national identity, our ethnic identity, whatever the, all the other myriad identities that we wear. We're mothers and fathers and spouses and sisters and brothers and neighbors. And there's so many different hats that we all wear in terms of our identity. But sometimes when we feel threatened, we will retreat into those deep planks of identity called religious and ethnic identity. A world of people walking around in monolithic identities is a world primed for conflict, probably violent conflict, because there, in that kind of mindset, there is no point of connection between us and people who don't look and be just like us. So we have to give that up. We have to give up an us versus them mentality, as tempting as it is sometimes to have it. This is the deep problem with the conflict that we hear so much now since 9-11, Islam versus the West. That's just a problematic formulation in the first place. There is no inherent conflict between Islam and the West. That's a false dichotomy in the first place. But if you buy into it, it creates the very thing that really has no grounding in the first place. So we have to beware of this, as tempting as it is, and as scary as it can be sometimes, we have to resist the us versus them mentality. As I said a few moments ago, and I've spoken too long already, this is the central challenge of our era, I believe. I would invite you to consider that as well, that this is the central challenge of our era. And it will require us to be bigger than we've ever been as human beings. One of my favorite quotes, and it's in this video that we saw, be as, as wide, as tolerant, and as wide as the ocean. Imagine that as an inner capacity to be as wide, as open, and as tolerant as the ocean, almost like an infinity, ever expanding, ever renewing itself, ever transcending itself. I love the metaphor of the ocean. It's no accident that it shows up in so many of the world's traditions. I live on the Gulf Coast. It's not an ocean, but it's a gulf. But you have hurricanes blowing, blowing, 60, 100 foot waves, winds and winds and winds, complete chaos. But what's at the bottom of the gulf? What's at the bottom of the ocean, even if there's a hurricane? Stillness, calm, peacefulness, equanimity. That's who we have to be. We have to become bigger than we've ever been, tolerant like the ocean, expansive like the ocean, willing to find connections with those who are very different from us. Being ourselves with others. Being who we are as Christians, as Muslims, as Jews, as atheists, as whatever we are. Being ourselves with others. That's the central challenge of our era. And I. My intention and hope is that this little volume that I wrote can be just a modest contribution to what I see has to be a much more comprehensive, exhaustive, and ongoing conversation. Thank you for coming.
good. Um, I come from a community of, of scientists, and I wonder if you or perhaps others in the audience could uh, comment on um, what some women in particular in science see as um, a difficult uh, role for women to play in a more traditional Muslim community. And if you could uh, give uh, people like me who are interested in debunking the notion that it is hard for women to excel in what the West sees as traditionally male scientific uh, professions, some um, fodder for those future arguments. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> well, I think that the way, and maybe your experience is different, but my experience is when I hear these types of arguments from people, they're uh, coming from a place of criticism of Islam and suspicion of Islam and often ignorance of Islam. They're not bad people, not coming from any kind of evil spiritedness, but from just a general ignorance. And there's this vast generalization of the world of Islam and the role that women play in it. And you know, Islam is the second largest religion in the world. It's a, it's a culture, it's a civilization. It's, it's, and it's not one thing. It's multi-dimensional. And so one thing I always, myself, I always say, well, when you talk about, I say to someone who brings this up, I say, when you speak about women in Islam, which women and where? In, in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Indonesia, in Africa, where? And they're like, well, I just mean in general. I'm like, no, you can't just say in general, where? Islam is different everywhere. It's a world religion with hundreds and hundreds of years of history. It's not one thing, any one place. So to just push them a little bit on that, and often, you know, they'll begin, a light bulb will come and they'll say, well, I guess what I really mean is, and then they'll begin to narrow, and then, and then a more constructive conversation can happen. I think another context in which I've experienced this question is here in this country, uh, because the United States is an immigrant nation. And we have immigrants from all over the world coming to live here. And that's a difficult transition. Many here in the audience are immigrants to this country. And this is the strength of this nation. It always has been. And it's a difficult transition. I think the United States is kind of a hard country. Um, I, I don't know personally because I'm from here. But I would imagine, I mean, it looks to me like it's a difficult country to come into as an immigrant to f figure out. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to kind of make your way. And, and there's always that transition period where you're, if you're coming from a, a culture that's a more traditional culture with regard to women and then you're coming into this one, there's that period of transition and there may be some misfires here and there in negotiating that. But I think we see all over the various dozens and dozens of Muslim communities even in this country. There's no one form of Islam in this country. We've got so many different branches and faces of Islam in the United States that even within the, the, the Islam, Islamic communities in this country, you see great variability and, and change and growth and adjustment in the communities uh, here to a more, to the American way of doing things because they're immigrants living here. So I think there's a lot more uh, complexity and nuance there than mostly meets the eye. It's always good to point to the complexity. We don't like it because it's easier to, to stay simple. Because sometimes simplified things give us a handle hold. But once you get that handle hold, you got to go a little bit deeper and see the complexity. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Thank your, you. Your talk was delightful and Thank you. very informative. Uh, a couple questions for you. <coughs> How do you reconcile the fact that although Gilan espouses peace, tolerance, and human rights, um, I've noticed, and with all due respect to the ladies here, mm -hmm. um, many of the organizations that are associated with him, uh, the women are covered with headscarves. And uh, the men don't have that same constriction. Um, I believe that the headscarf is a way to show quote unquote modesty mm -hmm. um, as a woman, and it's a patriarch uh, patriarchal religion. Yeah. Uh, most of the Western, well, actually, I think all of the religions in the world are today. Right. And so how do you reconcile the fact that um, the women are not necessarily required, it's my understanding that they choose this on their own, but I don't believe a five-year-old girl makes that choice. Um, 
in, in this respect, and also just recently with the, um, the, the headscarf ban being overruled in Turkey, and now women can wear headscarves in uh, public yeah, universities and public right. institutions, um, we understand receiving many emails from Turkey. I was born there, many of us have been. Um, we just found out recently a woman was not allowed into a restaurant because she was not escorted by a man. And um, girls are not being given certain scholarships in certain schools if they don't wear a headscarf. And this is something now that's happening in Turkey, and we're wondering if it's going to go the way of Iran, or what are your thoughts on all this? OK, there's a lot of wrenches in that. So uh, a lot of things to cover there. So I'm sure I won't be able to answer all of it. Um, the issue first about the Gulen community and women in the community. I. My own experience and my own understanding is, is what I'll share here. Um, it's as you said, it's uh, women choose this or not. There are many women in the community who choose not to cover. There are many women who do. Uh, it's, it's up to them. What we see uniformly across the Gulen community with regard to women is that the women are uh, highly educated, allowed, e I mean, equal access, women are equally educated, master's PhDs, professionals in their disciplines if they want, you know, all of that. So there's tremendous equality um, on those types of opportunities. I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing because in the West, um, you know we get hung up about this headscarf. And I think we need to get over it. Because it's a scarf. What? And there are regulations for modesty for Muslim men as well. You notice that if you, you don't see, and I've traveled a lot over around the world with Muslims and been in many situations, you don't see Muslim men wearing short pants. You don't see them wearing tank tops. You don't see them exposing certain parts of their body. There's modesty regulations for men as well. Uh, the understanding in Islam and in Judaism Islam doesn't just make this up, it gets it from its, and I'm speaking as a world religion scholar here, not as a Muslim scholar, I'm not a Muslim. Um, Islam has two religions that precede it from which it comes. And the prohibition, uh, I mean the exhortation for modesty for women with regard to their hair comes from Judaism and from Christianity, and Islam picks it up in its own distinct way. And it's because a woman's hair is understood as part of her sexuality, and that needs to be guarded. And so Islam doesn't come to this conversation completely uh, virginal. It, it has a history with it. And so from a purely religious perspective, someone standing here as, uh, as an American, as someone who believes that with all of its faults, the United States has come up with one good thing in the Constitution, and that's the First Amendment, which allows freedom of religious expression, and it constitutionally guarantees it for everyone. And if women want to cover, they get to cover. And if they don't want to cover, they get to not do that. With regard to children, parents routinely enforce their family's religion on their children. That's what parents do. That's what we all do. We're, if we're liberal atheists, we push that on our kids too. It's just not as visible. It's not a scarf. So I guess I would want to defend a little bit, because I think we make too much of this scarf. It's just a scarf. It's a head covering. What? I know you don't agree. You asked me my opinion, though, so I'm telling you. Now, there are places where it's not just a scarf. And as you rightly point out, there are places where it's abused. There are places where it's made to mean certain things about devotion, about belongingness, and there's discrimination based on it. And I, I absolutely see no room for that. And I, I would, I myself would question that seriously. And wherever I see it, whether it's here, whether it's in Turkey, anywhere. Now with regard to, and I don't think anyone should be forced or required or denied employment because they cover or they don't cover. I think it should be completely up to the private individual and there should be equanimity across the board. With regard to Turkey, um, I myself, and I'm, I very much read uh, some of the columnists that write in Turkey, and, and I keep up with that quite a bit. Myself, I am, I am encouraged by the lifting of the headscarf ban, mainly because, not because there's not potential for abuse, 
there clearly is potential for abuse. And I, my understanding is not that the types of things that, you're, that you mention are just widespread and going unchecked in Turkey. I, that my own experience doesn't show that. And I, I go to Turkey quite a bit. But the reason I'm encouraged by it is because I take the lifting of the headscarf ban as a, renunci as a moving away from the radical, oppre potentially oppressive form of secularism that Turkey has been under for more than a generation now. And it's very different than the secularism that we practice here in this country. It's laicism, it's laissez-faire. And uh, Kamal Ataturk borrowed laissez-faire from France and from other places and applied it in the formation of the modern state of Turkey. And it is, a, it is a form of secularism that is hostile to religion and suspicious of religion. France is having this exact same conversation. And it's not to say that the laicistic understanding is out of bounds. I mean, France, you know, comes to its, its position on this after hundreds of years of religious wars where the body count was very high. And so they very much felt that they had to adopt a form of secularism that protected the state and the people from the ravages of religion because those ravages were very clear. And that's understandable. I don't think that model of secularism works in the long haul. It works maybe as a corrective for a time, which I think is the case in Turkey. I don't think anybody can deny that, I mean, as much as we may question Ataturk's th policies, modern Turkey is strong because of so many of the things that he put into place. But I think that form of secularism has sort of run its course, and it's time for a renewed conversation around that. Because it ends up being oppressive. You have people denied employment because they're devoutly Islam, Islamic. They, they can't attend universities. They can't pray in the space of, of the public universities and in public employment. That's oppression. That's oppression of religion. And so I, I'm, an, I'm heartened because I think the party in power now in Turkey sees that. And the EU process, whether or not Turkey ever makes it into the EU, I'm doubtful about that. Um, but I think the process is pushing those kinds of conversations, pushing the, the party in power to consider ways in which religious freedom needs to be more encouraged, ways in which human rights need to be more firmly uh, um, committed to ways in which the democracy in Turkey needs to be more and more purified and, re and uh, redone and, and made better. So I'm optimistic. I'm not uh, scared of the party in Turkey that's in power. But as of last night, the government I saw. is told That's the, mil the military. No, no, not the military. The, the uh, judicial, right? Right. Enough is enough. Yeah. You are going against the Constitution. The Constitution says you cannot wear a headscarf and go to public school. Uh, right. University. Right. This is a conversation in Turkey. And I, this happened just last night, and I've been on a plane for many hours. So I haven't, I'm not up on the research just yet on that. Okay. So, uh, but in general, I want to say that I, I think we have to be very careful in making the mistake, in not making the mistake of seeing. Turkey as you know going down the road to being Saudi Arabia. I, I just I just think there's no there's no there's no uh, Sharia law and it's going to become an you know I, I I think those are very premature and very um, ah historical actually. So uh, thank you very much for the information. Uh, when you visited Turkey, the schools and other places, what have you seen different from United States or other places. Can you better compare that? Well, the food is better in Turkey. Yeah. Uh, in many places. Uh, you know, the schools are very inspiring. What I like about the schools is that uh, they are what we, I would call, and I'm not saying that the Gulen community schools would use this term for themselves, but they're what we would call classic liberal arts humanistic education where you're learning classic you know, math, science, reading, history, language, music, I mean, classic stuff, in a context of what in this country now is called virtue education. Virtue education, not religious education. The Gulen schools are not religious schools at all. Uh, they don't teach religion. Um, but it's, it's virtue education, teaching students how to be good citizens, good neighbors, good people. And that's a distinction 
that I think um, in this country we've done it in our public schools. I think we've gotten away from it in a lot of ways, and I think we've lost our way in some respects. So I think the model of the education uh, that, you, that you see in the Gulen Community Schools ought, brings something to the table on that. Not that it'll work everywhere, but it, it brings something to the table. I like that very much. Thank you, Dr. Carroll, for your time. My name is Janan Hash. I'm, I'm a criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney and an adjunct <clears throat> professor at McCormick Theological Seminary. Um, I really liked what you had to say about that us versus them narrative. And I see it very much in the media, as you pointed out. Uh, my question is, what do you, how do you see the future of that narrative? And what can we do here in order to help overcome that narrative? So it's no longer us versus them, but us with them. Yeah. I don't mind identifying myself as a Muslim uh -huh. and raising my kids as such, but I also teach them it's not, and not, it's not us and whoever is not us is versus them, but it's us with our neighbors. Sure. I think there are a lot of things that we can do, and we have to do it at every level. You know, each of us lives at many levels at once. We live as citizens or residents of the country that we're living in, of the area of the country that we're living in. We live as citizens of our community, in this case, Chicago area. So, and we have neighbors, and so there's that identity. And then there's our, with our family and friends and that. And so there are things that can be done at every one of those levels. At the biggest level of national and international, I think something like citizen diplomacy, this is a term that we've used in this country for many decades, but I think it very much works. The more we, under, we travel to visit each other, the more we explore the world beyond our own comfort zone, the world opens up and we begin to see that those people that we've called them, they don't actually live the way they thought, that we thought they lived. They don't actually think the way that we said they think. And we can only know that through encounter. So I think those kinds of programs, I, and, and it's the same kind of thing. My center um, works with uh, another organization and the mayor in Houston, and we were promoting this throughout the country actually, where people, we, we do a project called the Amazing Face Dinner Dialogue, where strangers, we, we group them up together in groups of eight and 10. They're strangers to each other, they're different religions, and they have a dinner together in a private person's home, and they have a facilitated conversation using dialogue cards uh, about the role of spirituality or faith or whatever in their life. And it's for people of all faiths and no faith. And the first time we did it, we had 20 host homes with about 250 people. Second time we did it, nine months later, we had 75 host homes with about 850 people and three other cities joined us. And then now we're doing it again in November and we, uh, we are online to have about 10 cities around the country join us. We'd love to have Chicago. And uh, about uh, 5,000 people. And what we hear from that, the, in the feedback, from people when they write on the evaluations, we had no idea. We had no idea that we had so much in common with people from different faiths. We had no idea about Muslims. Because you know, in a post 9-11 world, that's, you know, people are scared and they're suspicious. And they say, we have no idea. And for many of them, it's the first time they ever shared a meal with a Muslim. For many, first time they ever met a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Jain or a Sikh or a, a Wiccan, Wiccans and Zoroastrian. We have everybody participate in this thing. And so it's a very grassroots, personal, one-on-one -on -one kind of encounter. And it makes a difference. And it jolts people. So this kind of thing. And I know the Niagara Foundation and, and all, every other interfaith organization in this city supports that kind of stuff. It's not flashy. It's not sexy. It's not, you know... It's hard slogging work sometimes to set that stuff up. And the difference that it makes can't always be readily measured because it's differences of the heart. But man, does it make a difference. And we have the perfect situation to do it here in this country because we're an immigrant nation. We've got people from all over the world living here. Every one of the world's living religions is alive and well in the United States. And all of them are alive and well here in Chicago. So we've got the perfect laboratory to do this kind of thing. We have to give ourselves to this kind of stuff. We have to make it a priority. I have two quick questions. First is, as far as I know, you had an opportunity before writing this book to meet Mr. Gulen, uh, even though he was sick. Uh, I'm very curious about your experience by meeting a, uh, such a person. Uh, what kind of questions you ask simply and what were you expecting before you went there to meet him? The second question is, why an American academician would choose such a person to research on? 
Okay. I mean, after 9-11, everybody is curious about Islam. Quran is one of the best-selling books in Amazon.com. Uh, people are still suspicious about Islam if it's uh, promoting terrorism or promoting peace. But at the same time, people are would like to know about Islam. That's why Islam is very popular lately. So uh, why would an American academician go for Mr. Gulen but not any other? Because he's getting so popular, right. as far as we know, in the Western society right, right. now. A lot of PhD dissertations, yeah. a lot of sociologists are working on him. So what is, is he sacrificing on Islam? Or what is he doing than many Western academicians? Because people are suspicious. People say, hey, if a lot of American academicians are going after him or doing researches on him, that, that must be something suspicious behind it. My meeting with Mr. Glenn, I was about 80% finished with the book when I had the opportunity to go and visit with him in, in the retreat center where he lives in Pennsylvania. And so he was very gracious. He was not feeling well. And our plane was about three hours late because of a storm. And then it was pouring rain and wind. I felt like I was in a hurricane in Texas. And it took us long to get there. And so we were about five hours late for dinner. And we kept calling and telling him to go to bed. He, you know, but he waited up for us until almost midnight uh, to eat, even though he was sick. And we felt so awful. But it was a delightful thing to meet him. I really had no expectations uh, in particular. I expected him to be someone who was knowledgeable and generous and gracious um, because of everything I heard about him. And he was all that and more. And um, so I, I had, we had a dinner meal, and then we had breakfast the next morning. It, it just so happened that the timing of it was right after the pope had said those horrible things about Islam in one of those speeches, one of those early speeches that he gave, where, frankly, I think he forgot that he was the pope. And you just can't say, I mean, you know, he could say that when he's a university professor. You can't say this stuff as a pope. You know, you have to, it's a different level of accountability. But uh, so that was very much on people's minds. And he had spent the day contacting his Catholic friends in the Vatican and in, in various other places in the world, just extending friendship to them because, you know, they're in a difficult position. I mean, they are Catholics. They, they very much respect their pope, and, but yet they've made friends with Muslims, and it was a difficult thing for them. So he had spent the day doing that. So we had a lot of conversation around that. I didn't so much ask him questions about the book, um, about what I was writing. Maybe because I'm a Western scholar. I'm a secular Western scholar. I do my work. It's the second book I've written on someone who's living, which is a tricky thing. Because they change, you know, they change their views in the middle of you writing a book, and then it just you have to throw out the whole chapter. Uh, it's, it's a tricky thing. I ask him a couple of questions. Um, there was one place in one of his books where he he says, you know, here's blah blah blah, and he's speaking, and then he says, but I'm going to stop here because I don't think the community uh, is ready to hear this just yet. And when he's, oh, I interpreted it to be the Muslim community and the community of people inspired by his ideas. So I, I put a big old star around that and took the book with me. And so at the meal, I said, um, you know, you say here that you don't think the community is ready to hear these ideas. Well, I'm not a Muslim, and I, I'm not a part of the community. I'm ready to hear them. What, tell me what it is, you know. And uh, he laughed, and he said, well, what do you think it is? And so I told him. and. He said, well, that's, that's in the ballpark. That, you know, so we had a nice conversation. He was very generous. Um, OK, why Gulen? I, I wanted Islam in the mix because of this post 9-11 mentality that we're in. And I feel like it's important to bring Islam into the conversation in a very direct and intentional and maybe even kind of a, a, a heavier way. You know, Gulen is in every chapter. You know, it's Gulen in conversation through his text with these different thinkers. He's featured in every chapter. And so he gets more page time than the others. I wanted to give that to Islam because I feel like people need to know that these, tr these great humanistic values are there in Islam. Now, why him? I wanted someone contemporary. It's easy to go back to someone, one of some of the greats, like Ibn Sina or Al-Ghazali or any of the great Islamic scholars from previous generations and find all kinds of stuff. I mean, they're just giants of scholarship. And I studied them in my training, and I could find them. But it's too easy for those who are suspicious of Islam to say, OK, that's true. Al-Ghazali had that view, but not Islam today. No Muslim today 
No Muslim scholars today are saying these things. I didn't want th that argument to be open. So I wanted someone who's living, alive, current, has a body of work that is readily verifiable, that's there, you can listen to the sermons, you can listen to the tapes, you can read the books, you can check the translations, you can follow the, the stuff, he's there, he's, li he's living, he's got a huge body of work. Plus, I wanted someone who was not what we might call peripheral to larger Islam. It's always easy to find some, you know, mystic off somewhere or some sort of person off on the side of a tradition that really is not standing at the heart of a tradition. I wanted someone who in their training and in their speaking about Islam <coughs> speaks for the heart of the tradition. So I wanted someone Sunni and I wanted someone from the Hanafi school because that's the largest school, one of the largest schools in Islam. And Sunni, of course, 85% of world Islam is Sunni. Nothing, nothing bad about the Shiites. I didn't want a Shiite, I wanted a Sunni scholar. And so for all those reasons, and then my own experience with Gulen, and he seemed to fit that. And then there's this immediate impact of his ideas where you see all the thousands and thousands of projects and initiatives that are going on right now practically applying these ideas that he is generating from Islam. So that's why I chose him, because I had these criteria. And he seemed to fit it perfectly. So that's why. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. We, have, we still have to uh, get those books of your sign. Yes. So uh, before we let you go, I'd like to um, invite Mr. Sheriff Slordan. He's, a, he's the president of Niagara Foundation to give his thanks to you and also present Thank you. you with a little parting gift. On behalf of Niagara Foundation, I want to thank Dr. Jill Carroll and all of you for being a part of this dialogue picture. What a wonderful picture this is. Uh, <clears throat> for us, dialogue doesn't simply mean talking to one another. It goes beyond talking, listening to each other, uh, studying problems together, working together for the good of all and most of all, living together in peace and harmony. We can demonstrate to society living together regardless of group, faith, or ideology. We sincerely hope this program will benefit all. Thank you for coming. on the book has been has been positive mostly but my impression in general in traveling around the country to different cities talking about these ideas is that there is a great hunger on the part of many many people not just in the Gulen community but just in general there's a hunger for people people want to know how they can make a difference with regard to dialogue and to bridging the gap between groups of people and that people want to hear about that and they're interested and I'm encouraged by that I feel good about that and I feel that many people understand that this is the next step that this is the next level we have to get to to create a world culture of tolerance and respect and so I'm encouraged by that I first came to know of Mr. Gulen's work and began to read it I immediately saw so many connections and it's like light bulbs were just popping and I saw the connections and I thought you know people don't realize this people don't realize that some of the greatest ideas that have come from human history intellectual history are in Islam as well and we need to know that and we need to see that and talk about that and bring that conversation along and so that's really what prompted me. I think what's so powerful about the Gulen community and other communities of people who are doing this type of interfaith work is that it's two things at once. It's grassroots, it's community-based grassroots action that has the potential for global impact.